Uh, welcome back to uh, week four. So um, this is, as I mentioned in the, in the announcements, um, week three is probably the most abstract part of this course. Um, and I, I think from the very beginning, I did uh, try not to sugarcoat it in any way that um, this is going, it, it, 3B is a tough part of course, um, especially the last week and week three with, it, I think electric potential and electric fields are the most uh, abstract part of the course. Um, now week five is going to be, um, will also involve a lot of fields and stuff, but this time it will be magnetic fields. In some sense, it's even more abstract. However, it's based on your understanding of electric fields. So if I, after probably the first lecture you heard about electric fields, you might struggle with understanding what is going on, what is this thing, what is this. Uh, I think I still see a lot of questions on Piazza about electric field lines. I'll try to get to them after the lecture tonight to, uh, before your test tomorrow to try to answer as much as possible. Um, uh, but hopefully after a couple of lectures, after a weekend, you start to gain more and more confidence with it and you start to know what they are for. And uh, I'll attempt to summarize everything in one, in one line, the, the key concept takeaway from in one line. And remember, there's the concept side and there's the problem solving side, which is very different. Okay, so the concept side, I think the takeaway is, maybe I should say two lines. The uh, conceptual side to take away is, um, we're trying to answer how things move and we're introducing a new co uh, non-contact force, right? So uh, th we agree that things are due to forces and we have a new non-contact force called electric. Uh, called electric force, right? And we realized that if I, I want to answer, if I put a positive charge here and a positive charge here, why does this guy move away from that guy? Right? Assuming this is the source, which uh, whenever we say source, just a reminder to you guys, we assume this guy is nailed down so it doesn't move. And I'm just interested in this guy um, moving. Of course, you can flip it around and then analyze why does the other guy move, but we'll do it one thing at a time. That's the beauty and the simplicity of physics, right? So the answer to this is in one sentence, the source emits an electric field and so it's a two-step process and the test charge is the field is the one that is applying a force on the test charge okay so uh, the source would create an electric field through something like this depends on what your uh, geometry is if it's a point source this is the formula for it so it creates the electric field and then this guy would feel a force from the source okay and then we have the other side of the story is the energy approach, which we say, forget about field lines. Let's look at uh, equipotential lines. So now if this guy is sitting here, you, you look at, so the story this time is different. It's a different story. The source is creating a potential around it. Okay, it's a very abstract word. It's almost like saying it's producing some magic field around it. Um, but uh, yeah, so if you have a point source, this is the formula for it, right, the source charge would produce this potential and the potential would um, have some value in, in this case this is a one over r kind of situation over here right? you see the further away the r the lower the v so you might have you plug in numbers you might get something like uh, 120 volts 110 volts 100 volts like this and we the rule here is it will go positive charges positive test charges would go from high potential to low potential so that is the reason why it goes away right so from now on if you have a niece a five-year-old eight-year-old niece who asks you why do like charges repel why do things repel from in fact how do all non-contact forces work um, there's two stories you can tell them one way of thinking about it is the force perspective where the source creates a field the field creates a force let me say that one more time the source creates a field the field creates a force on something else that's how non-contact force work it's not a magic idea where this guy suddenly influences this guy it's mediated through a field an abstract concept called a field okay and there's a different story is uh, source creates a potential around it um, with different values, right? Uh, it creates a potential, and then whatever um, this guy, the, the the test charge that you're interested in, does not directly see this, but it is sitting in the potential that this guy creates. So it will react not to this guy directly, but indirectly. So it reacts directly to the potential that the source creates. Okay. So uh, this is all how all non-contact forces work. In fact, gravity works the same way. So the Earth creates a gravitational field, and we are experiencing that gravitational field, or the Moon is uh, experiencing. The gravitational field of the earth that's why the moon gets pulled around the earth and that's why the earth gets pulled around the sun so the sun does not magically there's no invisible line that's tugging on the earth but um, if there's anything called an invisible line it's either the gravitational potential that's generating or the gravitational field right 
and we answer the question, why do we invent something more difficult to explain something very simple? The reason is because by inventing something more abstract like this, it actually answers more questions than we asked. Um, so that is the ultimate goal. So these, this is the summary of the concept side, the practical side that you've done in homework, you realize, oh, I, I need to add vectors, I need to do resolving vectors, all those nitty gritty stuff, which is um, a, a completely different skill from the understanding concept. So hopefully you can distinguish the two sides as well. Of course, through the course, you need to uh, learn both. Um, yeah. Uh, all right. Any questions from that? And hopefully one takeaway from the homework you learn is the potentials are much easier to deal with. I think there's a question. The one we're going to grade is you put four, uh, you put three point charges here. You ask what's the potential here or any other configurations. This is much easier to deal with, right? So uh, that's why we introduce this idea. Now, this week, we're going to take this idea and look at actual concrete applications on how do we build electric circuits out of this, okay? So there are a couple of... Um, things, uh, new term terminologies that we're going to introduce along the way. And uh, yeah, so this is the new chapter, chapter 13, currents and resistance. In some sense, you can think of today as we'll go through the basics of how, it, how does a circuit work, um, how does a simple electric circuit, and then tomorrow, uh, tomorrow's lecture, we'll talk about how do more complicated circuits work. So today's the simple version, tomorrow is the more advanced version of circuits, if that's how you can think about it. So before we analyze a circuit, I need to introduce some new words like currents and resistance. So these are a couple, there are five new concepts um, uh, that we'll introduce. Um, and today is in some sense more relaxed. It, it's more, these are more simple. There's not as much abstract things. Um, tomorrow, again, there's not much abstract things, but it's just more, um, the, the problem solving side is, is, uh, is tricky. <laughs> but today it's going to be a, quite simple um, overall, or, uh, comparatively <laughs> at least. All right. First, we'll introduce what does, how does a battery work? And <laughs> you will be surprised how simple that answer is once you understand, um, uh, once you understand what uh, potential is. And voltage. Uh, current, resistance, and power. So these are five new jargons that you will need to learn the definitions of. Um, they're not too, uh, not uh, very much difficult. And um, after that, you'll be able to look at some simple circuits. And tomorrow we'll look at more techniques to deal with more complicated circuits. Okay. So before we dive right into this, um, we will obviously circuits are built out of wires. And I need to make a few comments about wires because wires are essentially conductors. So um, let's fill in some gaps about uh, how do conduct conductor works and what is the definition of that um, because we need to build our circuits out of these wires, okay? So uh, the first thing we'll, before we dive into a battery, um, let's learn a little bit about conductors. Okay, so there are a couple of facts. There are three key facts that you need to know about conductors. The three key properties, okay? Call these key properties. First of all, is uh, oh sorry. First of all, let's have the definition. The definition is very simple. The definition is uh, a conductor is where the charges are free to move. Again, this is ideal conductors. So they have uh, essentially no resistance. Okay, so you can think of it as no resistance or inertia to move. So they're completely, if you have any charges in them, they're completely free to move. So the first property is if, as a consequence, if you put, a, if there's a net charge on, on a conductor, all the charges, all the net, remember net charge doesn't mean, um, if, I say, if I say net charge is zero, it doesn't mean there's no charge. It just means there's equal amount of positive and negative charge. If I say the net charge is um, five coulombs, it doesn't mean there's only five charge floating around. It means that there's millions of charges, but there's five coulomb more positive ones than negative ones, okay? And so if there's a net charge, let's say a net positive charge, all net charges will always reside on the surface, on the outer surface of a conductor, okay? This is fact number one, okay? Facts. okay. Even if it's a weird shape like this, I don't know what that shape is, <laughs> but, uh, and if it's, it can be negative, it can have a net negative charge, then all the net negative charges would reside on the surface, okay? And it is quite easy to explain because um, if it's free to move, let's use the definition, right? If it's free to move and assume something is perfectly neutral first, all right? So now I, start, I, I put two extra charges in it. So if it's completely neutral and now I put two extra positive charge in it, what will positive charges do? They will repel. So they will try to get as far away as each other as possible like that. 
And if I put a third charge in there, these three charges would try to get as far away from each other as possible, like this. And if I put a fourth one, now you see the logic. If I keep building up, they'll try to get as far as away from each other as possible. And that's why um, they will start to fill around the, um, around the edges. Um, and as I said, there might be positive and negative charges uh, floating around. There might be other neutral um, pairs floating around in the middle. Um, but those won't get affected. It's only any additional net charges that will get uh, pushed all the way to the edge. All right? So you can put it in words. I'm not going to write it out in full. But basically, you can say any net charges will di be distributed or reside on the surface. Okay? And the second fact is, um, if your shape has some sharpness to it, all the net charges would actually, so if this part is very sharp, there will be a lot more charges on the sharp edges than the other less sharp edges. Again, this can be understood by the same logic is, imagine if I put a lot of new charges, some extra positive charges in here, and they want to try to get away from each other as far as possible, and they're completely free to move, so there's nothing stopping them. So if I put one charge here and then a second charge here, um, where's the furthest one, the second one can go. The furthest one is as far as away. So if there's any tip um, that protrudes out, it will go there more than the others like that. Okay? Uh, it works the same with positive and negative. Okay? So you can put that in words that charges will congregate at sharp edges or sharp surfaces. So if I, if I have a block like this and I, um, and I ask you where, where are most of the charges resided, um, most of them will get aggregated um, on the edge, sharp edges like this. And the third fact is, it, inside a conductor, the electric field is always zero. Okay, so it, we can draw that as, first of all, we know that even if you have a net charge distributing on the surface, the electric field inside is zero. Now, this is more difficult to explain just from intuitively, um, because you might think, okay, this guy would create an electric field. That is true. And this guy would create an electric field. So over if you pick a point in the middle, let's say I pick this point, or not even, if I pick this point, let's say, then uh, what is the electric field, net electric field here? So due to the one on the top, it will create an electric field that way. Due to one on the bottom, it will create an electric field that way. Naively, it doesn't look like they'll balance and create, and it will be uh, zero. Um, but the, I, I can only give you a rough answer, is this, uh, this guy um, will be influenced by much more of these charge than the other side. So although this little vector is shorter, um, it, will, it has more of these little short vectors than the other side um, from the, let me draw a line like this. So all the, all the charges on this side, you see there's more charges on this side that is contributing to electric fields pushing it to the right than there is charges on the right-hand side that creates electric field pointing to the left. So as a result, there's a magical balance between here and makes everything zero in here. The more formal explanation is through Gauss's law, which is a more advanced technique, which requires some uh, more advanced calculus to, to explain. So we'll, uh, if we have time at the end of the course, uh, we'll supplement with uh, that theory over there. For now, um, you don't need to worry about the logic behind this, but understand this just as a fact, remember as a key property that uh, electric fields are always zero inside conductors. Okay, all right. Um, so let's see if you can put this knowledge to use with an example. So uh, if I have a conductor that is actually a hollow sphere like this, okay? And uh, this, let's say this is a neutral conductor. So that means it has a lot of positive and negative charge. And then there's a hollow cavity, a, a hole in the middle, okay? It's a sphere. So there's just a, just a cave, there's a hole in the middle. All right, uh, now, so, so it has radius, inner radius one and radius two. Now, if I put an extra point charge over here, let me use a different color. Let me put an extra point charge over here of five coulombs, let's say. So inside, let's put positive five coulombs. The question is, how will the charges redistribute in the conductor? Okay. Think about how will all these, um, it's overall neutral, so there's like a million you know, infinite positive charge and infinite negative charge. If I put five coulombs, positive five in the middle, how will these charge react to this guy in the middle? charges in the conductor react or redistribute. Okay, so this is how you can analyze it. Remember, the charges are completely free to move.
Oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry, hopefully it's booting back up. I don't know why it keeps doing that. Does any one of you know? Or is there anything I can do to stop it from kicking me out? <laughs> Is it down? Is it is it down all over the country today? I see. So it's not only California. All right. Yeah. If anyone knows any tips that can uh, make this more stable, that would be that would be good. Um, yeah, we'll do our best with this. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So this is how you can think about it. So remember, the charges are free to move, right? So all the positive charges and the negative charges are completely free to move. And for now, don't think about electrons you know, being bound with protons, because we're in the classical picture where a lot of these theories are developed before even electrons are discovered. So they're completely free to move. Um, you just think of them as positive and negative charges floating around. Um, if you have positive charges here, then you will start to attract all the negative charges to the inner surface, right? OK, so what will happen is if you have a positive charge in the middle, you will start to attract all the negative charges. Not all, but you'll attract some of the negative charges over here. How much negative charge do you think in total you can attract to the inner radius? It should be. If that's positive 5 coulombs, it should be negative 5, right? So you can attract negative 5 coulombs amounts of negative charges here. Once you get ne negative 5, it doesn't mean that there's not any more negative charges. There's probably a lot of a million other negative charges. But if I have an extra negative charge here, there's no more incentive for this guy to get attracted to the middle because as far as this guy is concerned, this whole thing is neutralized. So I can almost draw it like this and almost consider that here, the middle, the, the middle part plus five and the minus five as a whole is basically neutralized. So as far as um, this extra minus sign is concerned, it's not going to be attracted over there because everything is balanced out. Okay, so uh, you will only be able to attract minus five coulombs over here. But we also say that the conductor was neutral, right? So if there's minus char five um, coulombs amount of negative charges congregating over here, where will the, th there must be extra plus five coulombs of positive charges sort of being unpaired, right? So there must be around like another, let, let me uh, do, let me assume one charge means one coulomb. Um, not necessary because if that's really a proton or an electron, you know, it can be a very small amount. I need a lot of charge to be five coulombs, but uh, whatever. Let's just assume there's five over here. Um, all these are neutralized, so there's no incentive for this guy to go full, uh, inside or outside. However, um, as far as this is concerned, they are just behaving like net positive charges. So from rule number one, they will try to get away from each other as much as possible, right? So it, these extra charges won't even see what's going on in the middle, and these will, let me redraw them or move them to the edge. So all, all these extra charges would get pushed to the edge. And how much will get pushed to the edge? Well, the whole thing has to be neutral. So on the, on the edge, on the outside radius, there will be plus 5, right? So you can summarize it like uh, in, on R1. On R1, there will be negative 5 coulombs of charge. On R2, there will be plus 5 coulombs of charge. Now, let's try a second example. Um, if I have, what if I have the same problem um, with a negative charge in the middle? Can you repeat this process? So if I have, let's say, in the middle, Q is uh, negative three coulombs, and the conductor, the Q of the, con the net Q of the conductor is zero, okay? So this is, I'm gonna leave this as an exercise for you at home to try uh, to answer what is the net charge on, the net charge on R1 and the net charge on R2. So this time I'm going to put minus three coulombs. Should be pretty straightforward. Okay. The more complicated one is if I have a net charge on the conductor. So this time, if I put a charge, let's say let's say minus three. Okay. And this time the net charge on the conductor is not zero, but let's say it has positive ten coulombs. So how would this work? So let's say there's minus three over here. Okay. So you just go through the same logic. What does plus 10 coulombs mean? It means mostly everything is balanced like this. Okay, mostly it's balanced. However, there's extra 10 coulombs unbalanced. Okay, so mostly they are balanced. Um, I'll put a bracket around it just to emphasize. Mostly they're balanced, but there's some extra bits over here that is unbalanced. All right, so uh, first of all, everything is free to move. So if there's minus three over here, it will attract positive, some positive charges to the inner radius, right? 
So first of all, you, how much positive it can attract? Well, it'll, if this is minus three coulombs, it will attract positive three coulombs amount of charges. So on R1, you will get, so the net charge on R1, you will get positive three coulombs, right? So what, after you get negative three coulombs here, think of this as completely balanced out, right? This is completely neutralized. So any remaining charges, any remaining positive charges, and there should be because there's plus 10 amount remaining, right? Uh, sorry, uh, no, there's plus 10 amount in total. So um, any remaining will get pushed to the edge because they don't care anymore about the center, right? So how many, what is the net charge on R2 on the outside edge? Well, they should all add up to 10, right? So there should be plus seven coulombs residing on the, on the edge, okay? So again, not too difficult, um, but uh, we'll, I'll give a small variation for you. Uh, so you can try this at home. And uh, this time, so, so the same figure inside, we'll put a point charge that is, that is minus three. And this time, um, sorry, let's, put, let's make it plus three for your exercise. So we'll have a positive point charge in the middle and uh, outside is positive 10 coulombs as well. Okay. So answer the same question on R1, what is the net charge on R2, what is the net charge? All right, so if you can do this, you know everything you need to know about conductors. Okay. All right, so now that you know what uh, conductor um, do, we can see how you can use these ideas to make a battery. Okay. Everyone got this slide? Okay, so we'll introduce those five terms that we said we need to build a circuit. The first thing is an electric battery. So if I talk, so uh, if this sounds like a very complicated thing, because if you talk to a chemistry student or talk to a chemistry professor, they will, they will spend a whole lecture to tell you what a battery is. You know, you, you first need to know some ionization, some chemical reactions, so you put a copper and zinc and anode and cathode, all these weird words that I have no idea what they mean. <laughs> um, but for a physicist, an electric battery, I can answer that in one minute or one sentence. It's a device that creates a potential difference. That's it. <laughs> to us, that's what we care about. Now, I'll talk about it before I write down the things you need to know, so you get an idea first. So imagine you have a, uh, it, it, so this is, I'm going to draw a battery like this. Let, imagine this is a, a typical 9-volt battery you can um, build, um, or maybe a 1.5-volt uh, battery you can buy um, in, at Walmart or something. So what you have is you have one negative terminal. You have a negative terminal and a positive terminal. So a battery is something that creates a potential difference between these two terminals, okay? okay positive terminal, okay. So what that means is um, if you connect this with a conductor like a wire, remember, remember charges are completely free to move. So there is a potential difference. Uh, imagine, uh, so this is, these are the positive charges in the wire. So the charges, uh, assume they cannot go inside the battery because inside the battery is very complicated. So let's not look at that. <laughs> let's just look at outside. All the charges would go from positive, or sorry, go from high potential to low potential, right? So if there's a potential difference, so let's say, uh, so this is the 1.5 volt is actually telling you there's a potential difference between the positive and the negative, right? So positive means it's a high one. So let's call, let's say this side is 1.5 volts. This is zero volts, okay? It doesn't matter what the absolute potential is as we talked about last lecture. It's only the potential difference that causes the, the, the physics to happen, right? So all the positive charges will go from high potential to low potential and they will all start moving this way. And now you have a circuit. So the key job of a battery, and I'll write down the definition, is a device that sets up a constant potential difference. Okay, so that's it. So it's a device that sets up a constant potential difference. I put the constant in bracket if you so that uh, if you uh, if you forget the word constant in, in an exam that yeah, that wouldn't that's not the crucial bit. The, uh, you won't get points off from doing that, but the, the key word is it sets up a potential difference, okay? All right, uh, yeah, so that, uh, 
inside, to be fair, inside it is complicated. It's a lot of chemistry going on to create this potential difference. But for physics, lucky for you, is we're focusing on the outside. It only We only care about what's happening on the outside. And as long as there's a potential difference, then charges will start to move from the high potential to low potential. By the way, uh, how do I know this is five, uh, 1.5 and this is zero? Uh, I don't, uh, and I don't really care, frankly, because I just need to care um, that one side, the difference is 1.5 volts, okay? Um, so this could be 10 volts and this could be the absolute potential on one side could be 10, absolute potential on the other side could be 8.5. As, as long as, so no one really cares what the absolute value is, as long as the difference is that way, because remember, um, it is related by this, right? Potential difference. And if you multiply by how much charge, it will create the energy difference. And that's all we care about because this is the thing that affects the kinetic energy of things. All right, so let's uh, introduce the symbol, uh, the circuit symbol for it. So we don't want to draw an actual battery every time. So we have, we invent a symbol for it that looks like this. Okay. All right, so you see there's one longer leg. I'll try to draw that better. Uh, one longer leg and one shorter leg like this. And uh, sh the shorter leg represents the negative terminal. The longer leg represents the positive terminal like that. Okay. I re so the easy way to remember that, the, the way I remember that is the shorter leg looks like a negative sign, right? So that's how I remember that one is negative um, and the uh, longer one, yeah. longer positive. It's an easy way to remember it. Okay. All right. So how do I measure? Uh, so what, what, is, what, what is the quantity? What is the actual quantity to measure how powerful a battery is? Well, it's the potential difference and we, have, we give it a name. So the, maximum, the, the actual maximum potential difference of a battery, it's called the EMF. It's called electromotive force. Um, it's a, quite of a misnomer, but let me write that down first. So the quantity that measures the strength of a battery is called EMF. Now this is quite a historical misnomer um, because this is short for electromotive force, but it's not really a force at all, all right? The, uh, the symbol we give, is, the uh, variable we give is capital epsilon like this. So this is the Greek letter epsilon, usually capital, but it doesn't matter. Sometimes it's lowercase, sometimes uppercase. And so this EMF definition is, it's the maximum potential difference the battery can provide. So first thing you want to know is what's the SI unit or what SI base unit, right? That since it's a potential difference, the SI base unit is, is just volts. Okay. So even though the name is called electromotive force, it's not Newton's. So this is purely historical misnomer that people think, oh, the battery must be providing a force to push everything around. But then they realize that that's not the right way to think about it. It's really setting up a potential difference. So it's um, uh, every time, so we'll use, usually use epsilon like this to denote um, what is the maximum potential difference that the battery can provide. Okay. That's the EMF. Now, I put the word maximum over here is, does that mean every, if you buy a nine volt battery, does that mean it will actually set up a nine volt um, potential difference between the two terminals? Not necessary. This is an ideal battery because most mule battery inside have a little bit of resistance. So you don't actually get nine volt. It's quite a rip off. <laughs> if you buy a battery, you know, from whatever store, um, they, they, they market it as nine volts, but it's not actually producing nine volts. It's a little bit, maybe 8.9 or something. So an ideal battery means this, there will be no um, internal resistance. We'll talk about internal resistance actually in, a, in tomorrow probably. Um, but for real batteries, this, maybe you can make a small note for now. Real battery, there's something called internal resistance. Okay. So there's another concept we'll talk about in later is called terminal voltage. So the terminal voltage is the potential difference between the terminals, between the positive and negative terminals. Okay. So for a real battery, the terminal voltage is slightly less than the EMF for real batteries. So the terminal voltage could be maybe like 8.9 volts when the battery is marketed as 9 volts, something like that. So that's all you need to know about battery, simple. So now let's move on to currents. Okay. There's actually two concepts over here. Um, but uh, let me start with an opening question for here. Okay. So I want you to guess, um, so let's, we've introduced this, uh, we've introduced this symbol, right? So we've introduced 
this is a battery. Um, let's say I've connected with a wire to a light bulb like this. Okay. So uh, this is positive, this is negative. Um, that means all the positive charges on the wire would start going this way, right? Will, so in reality, this is also another historical misnomer. Um, now, now that we've discovered the electrons, we know that it's not really the positive charges going this way. It's really the electrons, which is a negative charge, going the other way. Right? So uh, for most of the course, uh, we will actually stick with uh, just thinking about positive charges moving. But keep in mind, at the back of your mind, that it's really the electrons that are moving this way. So temporarily, I will write out the real situation is where electrons would go this way. You can kind of see this is a good idea for a, a symbol of a battery because uh, the electrons are going to be repelled by the negative terminal, right? So it's going to go this way, but there's a gap between here. So that's a good way. This is a good symbol, whoever created this. is The electrons cannot jump over from the negative to the positive this way. The only way is going through a conductor, going through the wire with an ideal wire with no resistance. So it should move over this way. Um, how does a light bulb work? It's basically now you finally create some resistance over here. So uh, the light bulb is made of some wire that is uh, with more higher resistance. Okay. So now uh, the, the wire are usually made of copper, which is a very good conductor, which is as close to ideal as you can get. Um, so it, nothing's going, really going on over here, but now there's a lot of resistance, a lot of friction. So the electron starts um, uh, struggling to go through the wire over here. And as it hits more and more friction, um, you know friction creates heat. So the wire will heat up, uh, usually tungsten. Uh, however you spell tungsten, I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll double check later. Um, or someone can tell me on the chat that's the correct spelling. Um, and uh, the tungsten will start heating up. And uh, when things heat up, it'll, it'll glow. It'll, so that's uh, how the simplest light bulbs are created. Right. All right so Here's a, uh, my opening question. How fast do you think the electrons would move? Let's say I actually put a switch over here. So let's see if I can just erase this. So this is a symbol for a switch. Just like this. So if you push that down, you'll connect it. If you, if you leave it open, yeah, then the, the circuit is open. So as soon as I close the switch like this and push it down, how fast do you think the electrons would move um, from one end to another? So can you guess the average velocity for it? So you try to just with your intuition, throw in, in terms of meters per second. In one second, how many meters can this move in the chat? Um, see what you will, uh, what are some numbers you can you guys would think it moves. Is it one meter per second, 10 meter per second, a thousand meters per second? If I close the switch, how fast, um, how fast would the light turn on? And uh, does that give you some estimate? 10 to the power of one, do you think? Would be the speed of the electrons. Speed of light, 10 to the power of eight. Good, yeah. Um, so I would think so as well. Um, so that is completely the intuitive guess. But turns out it is not really that fast. Um, in fact, it is extremely, extremely slow. Uh, I'll, I'll do some estimates in a second, but let me show you the answer first. It's around 10 to the minus five meters per second. So it's almost like, um, so that's around like 10 micrometers. One micrometer uh, one, or one micron, sometimes called. Anyone have any idea what one micron, how thick is one micron? It's roughly the thickness of your hair. It's roughly the diameter of your hair. So that's 10 hair strands put together per second. That's the speed that electrons actually move. So how does this actually, so clearly that, that goes against all our intuition because as soon as you close the switch, the light bulb goes right on, right? So what's going on over here? So let's actually do, uh, study the math is because of the electric currents, it's different from average velocity that the, elect uh, the electrons move. Okay. So um, the actual velocity electrons move is called drift velocity. So these are actually two different things. We'll see why this is happening. Um, so first of all, let's define what this current means. Current is, uh, it's actually easier in symbol, I'll write that first, is how much charge goes through per unit time past a certain area, right? So if you have a wire like this and the charges are moving like this, so you look at a cross section and you ask how many charge would go through uh, per unit time. Divide that, that's current. Okay, so I'll write that out. It's the amount of charge uh, crossing a given point per unit time. The keyword is charge per unit time, as you can see. Um, if you just want to fill in the correct grammar, you know, it's amounts of charge uh, crossing a given point per unit time. Um, 
put a box around this. The, the actual, uh, if, if you work in terms of infinitesimals, um, this is more accurate in principle, uh, but most of the time just uh, with, with delta is also good enough. So more precisely, you can think of it that way. In an exam, if either version you write, either the word version or either one of these equation version is, uh, is okay, all right? Um, the, the units for this, just to be complete, the units for this is amps, so symbol for A. Side unit. So a typical circuit has something like one amp. Okay. So typically, uh, of course, it can range from 0 0.1 amp to, to maybe 10 amps or, or even 50 amps. That would be quite high, actually. Um, it wouldn't go past 100 amps. That would be very, very high type of current. All right. So um, how do I find out? Let's say if I have a typical circuit of one amp, how do I find out how fast the electrons are actually going? Okay. So um, let's try to estimate that. So first of all, the current is dq dt. So it's how much charge going through a point, right? So um, at one, in each second, it's, there's not only one charge that goes through. There's actually a lot of charges that goes through here, right? Because there's a million charge inside, inside uh, the copper wire. Uh, once you set up the potential difference, um, uh, let's say these are all the positive charges. Let's think in terms of positive charge first. So one side has a higher V, higher potential, the other side is a lower potential. As soon as you set it up, the charge will start moving. So, and it's not, they don't go through like one at a time. They, many go through at a time. So let's say there's n amount of them going through. So in one second, there is uh, n times Q amounts going through, right? So this is the charge of one charge. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds redundant, but yeah. Uh, that's the number of charges, the number of charges. Right, so that this is the total charges passing a point, right? crossing a point, total. Right, so the total charge is the number of charges times the charge of you know one charge, one electric charge. Right, all right. Um, let's introduce another quantity called the number density. It's the number per unit volume. So this is number density. So it, it's in in each meter cube, how much, how many actual charges do you have? Okay, so. By now, you're familiar that there's many types of density. Uh, this is number density. It's just a little n, um, how much you have per unit volume. Okay? So the total charge is um, the number per unit volume times the volume times the charge of one charge. Okay? So what's dq dt? dq dt is the uh, n times, let, let's call that area times distance moved, right? So areas times x. It's q. So this part is the volume, a times x dt. And uh, what is constant going on here? So each charge, Q doesn't change, N doesn't change. The number, this is number per unit volume. Uh, let's say it's how many, how many atoms uh, per volume in copper, right? So that, that doesn't really change um, with time, with looking at time. The area of the wire doesn't change with time. The only thing that changes is X. The, the charge is moving in the X direction. So all these can be pulled out. So you have N, A, Q, and then you have dx, dt, which is the velocity. So this is actually the velocity of the charges. So we call that drift velocity. Right. So Vd is the actual um, velocity that each charge is moving at. Can you see that? Um, and you multiply by, if it's, this is the density of the material, if it's a very dense material, um, then the current will be larger because there's more charges going through at the same time. If the area is larger, then there's more charges going through at the same time, so the current will be larger. Right? If each charge is more, is larger, then the current will be larger. And of course, if the velocity is larger, uh, the current would be larger as well. So each of them contributes to the current. Okay? Um, so now let's quickly do some estimate uh, of Vd. So that we'll rearrange this. Um, so typically, I is one amps, right? And um, N is the number. So how many atoms do I have? So how many electrons do I have per unit volume of a copper? Uh, I have no way to estimate it. So I actually Googled this. It's around 10 to the 29. All right, so this is the only thing I probably couldn't estimate. Um, what is the charge that is moving through? Well, that's the electron. So the charge that's moving through should be E, right? That E, uh, that is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulomb this electric constant, right? Um, what else? A, all right, so what's the area of a wire? Here we can try to estimate, let's say it's pi r squared, the um, cross-sectional area of a wire. Um, what would you say is the radius of that? Uh, let's make life simple, let's say it's one millimeter. Okay. So pi times one millimeter squared. Okay. What is that? Uh, milli is 10 to the minus three, so this is basically pi. Pi is 3.14 uh, 3 times 
10 to the minus 3 meters squared, right? So this is 3.14 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. So I just uh, put the square in, so I get 10 to the minus 6. OK. And now uh, let's put everything in here. So I have 1 and number density 10 to the 29. Area is 3.14 times 10 to the minus 6 meter square. So everything is in SI units, so I'm not going to put in all the units. And this is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. OK, so you can plug this in a calculator, but while we're talking about estimates, let me show you some problem solving uh, skills as well in, uh, that hopefully you can take away in real life. Um, so how do you do this in your head, for example? Um, look at first, you have 10 to the power of something. That's the easiest part, so don't worry about that. Let's look at the coefficients first. OK, so you might be tempted to just plug this in a calculator. Of course you can, but let me just show you some quick tips uh, um, since uh, this is probably the way of thinking. So you can see the way how physicists will do what's called back of envelope estimations. Um, 3.14 is pretty much 3. 1.6 is pretty much 1.5, right? So what's 1.5 times 3? Well, uh, that should be 4.5, right? 0 0.5 times 3, 0 0.5 is a half. So this is 3 halves of it. So half of 3 is 1.5, and 3 times of it is 4.5. Um, so technically, this is a little one. We technically want 3.14, not 3. So that's a little bit more than 3. However, um, we actually want 1.6, so this is a little bit less than 1.6. Uh, so the, um, I, here I have underestimated a little bit. Uh, here I've underestimated a little bit. So overall, it should be a little bit more but than 4.5. Um, let's say around 5. Or maybe I should say this should actually be around 5. Okay. So if you are interested, you can plug this actually in a calculator to see how well you do. And you see that I'm actually not far off. So this is a good way you can do quick estimates in, in the future, right? All right, so this part you multiply, it's five. And now you take care of all the tens, right? So here you see there's uh, 29 minus 19. So that is just 10 to the power of 10 and then minus six. So that's 10 to the power of four, okay? So uh, what's one over five? One over five is two over 10, that's 0 0.2, right? So you have 0 0.2 times 10 to the minus four. What is the units for this? Everything was in SI units, so meter per second, or two times 10 to the power of minus five meter per second. So that's what I promised, right? So we can rewrite that as 20 micrometer per second. Okay. So you see, this is actually very slow. Um, if you take a quick Google um, and ask them what's the typical drift velocity of things, you see it's one times 10 to the minus five meter per second. I'm not that far off from just doing this um, estimate, okay? so. Uh, what's going, what, what's, okay, this is the math part that we analyzed, what drift velocity is. Um, wh why is this happening? Why, so why do, when we flip on a switch, why does the light bulb turn on right away? And here's the physics, here's the intuitive answer. It's because in the wire, there's lots and lots of electrons. Uh, so let's say your light bulb is actually here. Okay? So that's where your light bulb is. And the moment you connect the wire, you push down the switch and you complete the circuit, what happens is you immediately create a high potential here and a low potential here. That part actually goes at the speed of light. So at first, when, it's not uh, when the circuit is not complete, when it's broken like this, it's a battery, when it's broken like this, this um, uh, uh, you, you don't really have a potential difference because it's not a complete circuit. Um, the, the electrons here cannot really uh, sure, the battery would produce, let's say, nine volts on one side, zero volt from one side, but the electrons can't really go anywhere if you don't complete the circuit. But as soon as you complete it, immediately it will see that there's a way so, to go from this side to the other side, and it'll start reacting. However, it's not really this electron that went from the battery to the, uh, to the light bulb. It's the one that's right next to it that starts moving. Okay. So as soon, let me repeat that. As soon as you close the switch, the potential difference sets up almost instantaneously at the speed of light, technically, but almost instantaneously. And it's the electron immediately adjacent to the light bulb starts moving. So it's, for example, this guy that starts moving. And this guy is creating the friction and creating the light, creating the heat, creating the, uh, it warms up and then light up the light bulb. It's not that this guy has crawled its way to here to make the light um, go out, uh, go up. Does that make sense? All right, so the reason, uh, if you look at the derivation over there again, right, between the current and the drift velocity is, uh, even though this is extremely slow, 
if there's a lot of electrons, then as soon as you set up the, the potential difference, the current, everything will start moving at the same time and go past the light bulb. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay. All right, good. So uh, that's, uh, that's electric currents. And uh, so we talked about potential difference a lot. Let me introduce uh, the next word called voltage. Now voltage is very, um, very misleading because uh, from this chapter on, actually, uh, I forgot to give you reference chapters, uh, is 24, I think. No, it's 25, I think. 25.128, it's on Canvas as well. Um, from this chapter on, uh, whenever uh, they talk, we, when we say potential difference, usually we put delta V, um, but in this chapter onwards, they kind of get lazy and drop the delta and always just use V as, pot uh, as potential difference. And that is a source of huge confusion and it's very easy to make mistakes. So personally, I would suggest you always keep it as delta V when you talk about potential difference. And voltage literally is another word for potential difference. It's only people get tired of talking about potential difference and they say voltage. And also uh, when you talk about circuits, uh, that's, that is a common word. So um, when you know the, the, the outlet and your wall is 120 volts, um, the vol when people say the voltage is something, you now know it's actually just potential difference. Um, uh, or more simple cases, it, let's say this is your wall. Um, it has two legs, right? A plug like this. So what that means is if you plug things in, one, si one side of the terminal, the difference between one side of the terminal and the other side is 120 volts. It's the potential difference. And people say that this is the voltage. So in some sense, it's a simpler word, uh, but it's very, very misleading, um, especially when people use V. Uh, so at least in the beginning, I highly recommend you, when you solve problems, you stick with delta V until you're very, very comfortable. Actually, I, for, uh, for me personally, I'm never comfortable with just using V uh, because that will be confused with, uh, it's easily confused with, um, uh, uh, absolute potential. Okay. As a result, um, now if you if you draw uh, any circuits, let's say I have a battery and a light bulb, a simple circuit like this, and I want to talk about the voltage of the battery or the voltage of the light bulb. This is the symbol. You sh this is the note annotation you should use. So let me switch colors and draw it like this. So delta V of the battery and delta V of the light like that. So the preposition here is you always say voltage across something. This is very important. Okay. You can never talk about voltage off something or voltage off or voltage at a point. Okay. So never say the voltage here is something. That doesn't make sense. Voltage is always point B minus point A. Okay, so let's say this is point B, point A, like this. Okay. Whether it's A minus B or B minus A, that is not that big of a concern. That's just um, whether it's positive or negative. Um, some if you look at a magnitude, it doesn't matter that much. Um, let's say this is point C, point D. Right? So you, this is point C minus point D or whatever. Right? It has to be a difference. You cannot just say the voltage at A. This, this is meaningless. Okay? However, you could say current at A. So you could, the preposition for current, so these are the correct grammar, Positions for current, you can say the current at a point or current through a point, actually. Okay. So I could actually talk about what is the current. Let me use a different color. I can talk about the current through here. So that's just how many charge per unit time is going through a particular point. But whenever I talk about voltage, it has to be on two points, okay? So this brings us to how do we measure these things? Remember when you learn a new topic, you want to ask what is the symbol, what is the definition, and how do you measure it? Okay, so to measure it, let me start a new slide, is there's something called an ammeter and a voltmeter, right? The ammeter measures current and the voltmeter measures voltage or potential difference. So um, one thing you need to learn is how do you connect them properly? So if I want to find the current at some point, uh, first of all, the symbol is this. This is a ammeter that measures current. This is a voltmeter that measures voltage or potential difference. So every time you hear voltage, just think potential difference. Okay. That will give you the best idea um, to not go wrong with things. Um, if I want to measure the current, you put in the ammeter in, in the same uh, series as the object you want to measure. 
like this. So this is where you put it. Now, if you want to measure the potential difference or the voltage across um, the light bulb, this is how you will need to put it. You need to connect it. You need to create a branch, just split your wire into two, and then have the voltmeter go across it. Okay? Or if you want to measure the um, voltage across the battery, you put your voltmeter like this. You connect, you take your wire and split it in, into a separate branch like this. Okay. Um, how many of you have seen uh, maybe in your dad's backyard um, in a toolbox that you have, so, uh, maybe your dad would have one of these devices? Okay. So if you've seen this before, then now you know what, how, what, what I'm, what's going on over here. So if I want to measure, for example, the EMF, um, the, basically the potential difference or the voltage across the battery, you take one end and stick it on one side, the other end stick it on this side. So that's what's going on. And you'll find out what the, um, and how many volts it is across it. So you always talk about voltage across something, never talk about voltage at a point. You can talk about current at this point. Um, if you want to measure the current at a different point, you can put an ammeter over here. Um, but uh, of course, the current here will be the same as the current here because however many charges go through here must be the same over here. Um, otherwise, the charges will build up and there's a traffic jam. Um, imagine if the current, if you're driving on a freeway and the current here is faster and the current here is slower, then the charges will start piling up. Um, that's not a stable current. Um, so in a steady current, um, everything, all the current in, in the same branch would be at the same speed. Right? So um, that's that. So any of these devices, you see that there's two sides. If you want to measure the, the potential difference across the light bulb, um, I'll start to use the words potential difference and voltage very interchangeably to get you used to that. Um, then you put these two sides, you touch the wire, um, make sure you need to be able to touch the wire um, on both sides, and then you can measure the voltage there. Now, this is an ammeter. This is a very simple ammeter. You see how you measure this is you actually take a clamp and connect it in series. So now I'll introduce another jargon. This is called in series. And this is called in parallel. It's quite intuitive. So you connect this um, here and here, and then the current will flow through the ammeter and go through the light bulb. Okay. So that could be an easy short answer question that ask you um, uh, what, what is the correct way to put an ammeter in the circuit. So you'll need to know uh, for voltmeters, you need to put it this way. Uh, ammeters, you need to put it this way. Now, um, I need to put a caveat is some of this is a, a very old, uh, not very old, but it's a very simplistic device. Nowadays, if you go into an electronic store, if you go into Home Depot and try to buy a, a ammeter or a voltmeter, usually you won't find these alone. Um, and you will find a device uh, like this that will actually be able to measure both amps and voltage, both the current and voltage. So how does that do uh, that is? Because if I zoom in over here, you'll see that I can flip it to one side and it measures amps, right, milliamps in this case, up to, up to 20 amps. Or uh, if I flip it to the other side, you see it measures the voltage, um, how much volts of it. So how does one device do both? It's depending on how you connect it. Um, if, you if, you want to, uh, if you flip it to the ammeter side, um, make sure you're connecting it in series. Uh, because if you do it the other way, you actually burn the device. <laughs> and that's a very easy. Actually, nowadays, a lot of these devices have a safeguard that uh, if you connect it the wrong way, it'll, it'll, it, it will just tell you error. Uh, but in the old days, uh, you actually destroy the device completely um, because the current, it, it's not supposed to handle that if you um, put it in, in, uh, in the wrong way. Um, so uh, yeah, this is how you will connect it properly, even with one device. Um, if you want to measure the current, you see this is the battery, the, um, it goes to the light, and then you connect it in series. So it goes through the device and come out on the other side. If you want to measure uh, the voltage or the potential difference, then you take the red and the black and touch it with one side of the light bulb and the other side of the light bulb. Okay. Is that clear? This is another, this is a good diagram to see. Um, do you think this guy is measuring uh, voltage or current? And do you think this guy is measuring voltage or current? So the answer is the top one is measuring currents because it allows the current to go straight through, whereas this one is uh, touching two sides of this uh, and that is measuring the voltage okay, or potential difference. Okay. So one more, one last diagram to show you how the ammeter works like that. Okay. All right, so um, now let's, we have the two ideas of currents and voltage. How do they relate together? And this uh, nice guy um, called Ohms who found out this law, uh, basically the question is, how does the potential difference and current relate in the circuit? Okay. 
So um, Ohm's law found, uh, Ohm's found that the current is always proportional to the uh, potential difference, or most things are. So if you have a battery that is uh, uh, of a higher voltage, then you will have more currents going through here. Okay. So if this guy is higher, the currents would be higher proportionally, right? So when things are proportional, you know that you can write it in terms of a constant, something times a constant, and that constant, he calls it resistance. Okay. So technically resistance, R, is uh, defined as the ratio between uh, the potential difference and the current. Um, so if the resistance is high, that means you need more uh, potential difference to achieve the same, uh, to achieve the same current. Uh, if the resistance is low, um, then, you, then you just need a little um, bit of potential difference to create the same current, right? So let's say you want a current of one amps, um, and if the resistance is, uh, the, re the symbol, the, the unit is ohms, ohms, and this is the symbol for it, the SI unit. Right, so if there's a device that is five ohms compared to a device that's 50 ohms, then one of them, you just need five volts of potential difference to create one amp of current, and the other device uh, needs um, 50 volts to create um, one amp of current. So although that's the definition of R, this is the more practical version. So you can put a note, this is the more practical version. Um, as you know, as you probably very familiar by now, you know, the definition of density, mass per unit volume, uh, that's all good. But when you actually try to solve problem, it is easier to uh, think of, to use, rearrange it and use this type of version that way. Okay, okay so this is the idea of resistance. And uh, which, uh, now with that concept of resistance, um, uh, basically saying how much voltage you need to create the same current, um, you, we can talk, we can define what, this, what do we mean by an ideal wire. An ideal wire is one that has zero resistance. A wire with zero resistance. Okay, so R equals to zero. So what does that mean is if I uh, connect, um, so if I just look at the potential difference between this point and this point of an ideal wire and ask what is the potential difference? Well, from Ohm's law, this is IR, but if this is zero, that means the potential difference is zero. That means from this point to this point, there's no potential difference. Okay? So uh, if this point is nine volts, this point is zero volts. So this point is zero volts. And if I want to ask what's the potential difference between here, if it's a ID wire, there's no potential difference. So that means the absolute potential at this point is also zero volts. The absolute potential at this point is also zero volts. On the other side, this point is nine volts. Well, if this is an ID wire, then every point over here, the absolute potential is nine volts. So absolute potential, you can talk about the potential at a point, but potential difference has to be between two points. So now you see when I get to here, then I can, look at the potential difference before and after the light bulb, and I can see that this is nine volts, right? And uh, each material, each tungsten, um, you know, it can be a tungsten, it can be uh, alum uh, aluminum, it can be another type of metal. Um, each type of metal have its own resistance. So if you know the resistance, now you can calculate how much current is flowing through your wire. Uh, so let's say this guy has uh, one ohm, uh, uh, let's say this guy has three ohms of resistance, then I can calculate the current, which is um, the, this divided by R. So the potential difference, the current through the light bulb is the potential difference across the bulb over the resistance of the bulb, of the light bulb, right? So if that's three ohms and we get three, the SI units is amps. If everything you use is SI units, it'll come out automatically, right? Okay, so now you know that the current flowing through. And this is a general problem solving skill um, that usually current is the thing you find last. So when you do your homework, this is probably gonna be helpful. If you're confused, should I find V first or R first? Usually current is the thing that is most dependent on what you put in your circuit. Um, a battery does not control how much current goes through it. How, what, is, what the ingredients inside your circuit controls what the current goes through. So the current is the most dependent on everything else. Right? So the battery just controls the potential difference, the initial maximum potential difference or the EMF that it creates. And then uh, whatever material you put here will have its own resistance. Um, 
and uh, then the current is just depending on how much resistance the things you put in are. Okay, so now the next question is, if I have a lot of light bulbs put together, how do I add up the resistance? Okay, so there's two ways you can connect different devices together. One way is you can connect them in series and one way is in parallel, okay? So two ways. in series versus in parallel. Okay. So the uh, in series just means that you connect the um, light bulbs one after another, like what we showed you with the ammeter. Um, but at this point, we just don't, we won't, don't want to confine ourselves to just light bulbs, right? We want to be more general. Um, so in general, basically you can think of every, any appliance, um, whether it's a light bulb or uh, electric heater or whatever, it's just some things that create a resistance in the flow. Something that um, when the electrons flow through it, you make it not an ideal wire and you make the electron do some work um, by going through it. You provide some resistance to it. So we'll use a more general symbol like this. And this is a general symbol for resistors. Basically resistors is any device that provides resistance. So you can think of a light bulb as a special case of a resistor, um, uh, uh, the AC or a refrigerator or a toaster or whatever that you connect. It's something that just, it's basically a glorified resistor. It's something that pro provides resistance, right? So one way you can connect resistors or any appliances, I'm gonna use the word re resistor for appliance basically, is like that. And this is called in series, okay? And another way is in parallel. So you can have a battery like this. So you see all the positive charges would flow through everything. And a second way is if you have a battery like this, you can connect them like this. Okay. Or actually even make it more obvious that it is in parallel. Let me draw it like this. Okay. So sometimes books will even put a solid dot over here to emphasize that it's you're splitting the wire and branching it out that way. Okay. So um, yeah, this is two simple ways you can connect them together, or two or three. Okay. So what's the total resistance if you connect it this way? There's a very simple formula to, to calculate that. <coughs> the total resistance is, or sometimes we call the equivalent resistance, is just R1 plus R2 plus R3. No surprise to anyone, if you put them together, the resistance just add, because there's more resistance if you um, put them together. If you have the fourth one, just add them together. If you have just two, then just R1 plus R2. Now in parallel, it's a little bit tricky. It's, so you might not expect this formula. I'll write down the formula first and then I'll explain it. It's quite interesting. It's actually, it's the reciprocal of everything like this. So you add up the inverse or the reciprocal of everything if it's in parallel. Okay. So the first one is for in series. The second is for in parallel. Uh, let me just use the symbol in parallel like this. All right, what's going on over here? How does that happen? Um, I'll use the next slide to explain after you copy this. Okay. So um, as you can see, uh, I, can, I can redraw this diagram in the first way I've drawn it because the geometry is exactly the same like this. So first, hopefully you can convince yourself these two are the same, maybe I'll put them side by side. Like this. So what's going on is just instead of connecting this point here, I'm connecting this point here, right? So you see that so far, um, if the wire is an ideal wire, it shouldn't matter whether you connect it here or here because there's no potential difference across Notice the word I use, potential difference across ideal wires. There's no potential difference, right? The resistance is zero. Um, there's only potential difference across something that has a resistance, just to remind you since it's the first time you're seeing this. So if R is zero, you have no potential difference. Okay? If R is not zero, then you will have a potential difference. Right? Okay, so this is the first thing. Let's see if I can erase the dot as well. All right, and now you can see there's no reason why I cannot draw it just shrinking it down to here like this. So you see these are the same diagram essentially um, if the wires are ideal wires, okay? All right, so now let's look at the potential difference across this guy. So this is the potential difference of the battery. 
this is the potential difference of uh, R1. This is the potential difference of R2, of resistor number two. This is the potential difference across resistor number three. Right? Now, if this is an ideal wire, you should be under, able to see that this point is the same potential as this point. Let me actually give them names. Let me call this point A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, like this. Okay. So if the wire is ideal, then the potential of A, the absolute potential of A, is equal to the absolute potential of C. There's no potential difference between A and C. Right? And the absolute potential of B is the same as the absolute potential of H. Okay, so what that means is, let me put in some real numbers. Let's say this is nine volts on this side is zero. If A is nine volts, absolute potential is nine volts, then C also has an absolute value of nine. And H has an absolute value of zero, right? So whatever the potential difference of the battery is, it's the same as the potential difference between V3, or across V3, I should say. And with that logic, there's no potential difference between A and D as well, right? So all these points are nine volts because there's no potential difference if this is an ideal wire at, between any of these points, they're the same. And now let me complete the numbers over here. Same, if this point is zero, if, if this point is zero, this point is also zero. This point is zero, the absolute value of this point is also zero, right? The absolute potential is also zero, right? There's no difference between B and H or B and G because the wire is ideal. So now you see that the difference between E and F is also nine. The difference between D and G is also nine. So what I have, resulted in is this equality. Okay. Now how about the current? Now current is something that is the flow of charges, right? So let me use a different color. Current is, going, is flowing from positive to negative. That's the flow of positive charges. Now when I have a current of I going through here, now it splits up. Let's say this amount of I1 going through here, I2, notice the um, preposition I use, I say current through something, not, so it's a current at a, either at a device or through a device, but not current between two things, right? Current goes uh, past one thing, um, so it goes past all of these, right? If I use the original way of drawing it, that means at first I have I going through here, and then, um, so I a amount of current going through here, and then I1 going through one branch, I2, I3 going through each of these branches like this. What is the relationship between I1, I2, I3, and the original I? Let's call it uh, I0, or, uh, I total, let's say. Well, uh, the charges hit here and they should just split up. So um, just from common sense, you should just add the I1 plus I2 plus I3 should be I total, okay? So you have uh, the relation here where I total is I1 plus I2 plus I3. Okay. So let's combine this with Ohm's law. So Ohm's law tells you this is uh, delta V1 over R1. If you look over here, oops, uh, maybe I, <laughs> I should renumber these. Um, this should be one, this should be two, this should be three. Okay. So the resistance of R3 should be v, delta V3 over I3, the resistance of uh, V2 should be, or, or resistor 2 should be delta V2 over I2, um, et cetera, right? So we can write that down here. V2 over R2 plus delta V3 over R3. Okay. But since all the uh, potential difference across them are the same, now you see that these will get factored out. So it's just V total over, V total over R1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 plus 1 over R3 like that. So if I now um, imagine this is one, uh, the, the, um, let's see, uh, the, right now let me divide the delta B to the other side. I think you can already see where the inverse come from, but let me just complete the logic. A total delta V total equals to But remember, how was R defined? R was defined as um, this, right? So uh, if I have I total, V total, then I have R total, right? What's the total resistance? Um, this is one over R total because it's, uh, it's flipped over here. Okay. So, 
okay? So you see that one over R total, when things are in parallel, it follows this rule, okay? So you don't need to derive this every time. So after I showed you where this comes from in practice, you basically just use this, uh, use this uh, every time you need, okay? All right. And so that's resistance. I, uh, and the last, um, the last uh, quantity you need to know is what is power. Um, and electric power, so this is the last thing. Lots of definitions today. <laughs> so th uh, th this power on, on its own, hope you might have encountered this in 3A already, and then there's electric power. Um, so power on its own, uh, ignoring electricity, it's just whenever in physics we talk about power, it's just the rate of change of energy that is produced or consumed, rate of change of energy. So this is the key part. Um, if you want to complete the sentence a little bit more, so is the energy either produced or consumed? If you're talking about power plant, um, then you talk about how much power it's produced, how much energy it's producing per unit time. Uh, in equation form, power is energy per time. Then you're talking about how much energy you produce. If you're talking about a power plant, if you're talking about uh, a heater, the power of um, the power of the refrigerator, the power of the AC, um, and uh, uh, yeah, the power of some appliance, then it's the amount of energy it's consuming, right? So it depends on what you're talking about, whether it's produced or consumed. Okay, so um, the, in terms of, can we rewrite this in terms of all the things we learned today, like uh, the R, the resistance, or, so if I have a AC, um, I have an air conditioning that has some resistance and that has a certain potential difference across it um, and a certain current going through it, can I find out what's the power? Or if I, if I look at the AC and then it says uh, the power is 1,800 1, watts, uh, that's the unit, watts, SI unit. Um, let me look at the time. Okay, uh, yeah, I should finish in, in around five minutes um, or less. So, the, yeah, so if you just look at the, com um, the computer or uh, AC that says, okay, it's that much wattage, can I find out what the resistance is? Can I find out what the current is? All right, so can I re-express power in terms of this? And the answer is yes, uh, I'll tell you the answer first. It's just I times delta V. So where does that come from? Well, uh, this time we're talking about electric power, right? So we want the electric potential energy that is either produced or consumed. So uh, if you're talking about battery, I want to find out how much power this battery has, right? So you look at the EMF, what's the potential difference across it? Um, uh, this guy would produce some electric potential energy, right? Um, then you put that there, but we learned that potential energy is uh, Q times delta V. Okay. It's how much charge that is moving through here and the potential difference that will tell you that's how you relate these three things together. Okay. And here you see the charge per unit time, how much charge is going through. Again, it's not what, you, what symbol you put, it's what the meaning of a variable is. So uh, however many charge that is going through your battery that is producing, uh, that's moving, the battery is moving per unit time, that's current. So this is very simple, uh, three steps, you can get this result. Okay. And uh, if you're looking at the power consumed by an power consumed, so sometimes be careful whether it's talking about power produced or consumed, but usually it's obvious if you have an appliance that's consuming power. If you have a battery, then it's producing power. Um, the power consumed of, uh, of something with a resistance R, that it, then it will also follow Ohm's law. It will follow that the V is proportional to I. So you can see different versions in your textbook. You can see that. Um, uh, you can rewrite this as this. Right, so you can have this formula. Um, sometimes that is more useful. Uh, sometimes um, you can rewrite this and say I is delta V over R, right? So you can replace I with delta V over R times delta V. This is I delta V, right? So that is just delta V square over R. So you can have this version, this version, or this version. Um, personally, I just remember one of them, uh, just IV, this one. Um, and then if I, if, if in a certain problem, I'm not given delta V, then I will, use my knowledge of Ohm's law to figure this out so I don't have to memorize everything. Um, if the problem does not give me any I, it just gives me delta V and R, then I will use Ohm's law to substitute away I. And yeah, the power. All right. So yeah, um, that is pretty much all the key concepts over here. And we've talked about some simple circuits uh, like this. Um, here, maybe I'll leave you with one exercise um, and yeah, you can try 
uh, probably you'll be focused on the topic test tonight, but uh, maybe before, after the test and before next lecture, you can try this. Um, we, if I have a circuit like this, and with three resistors, R1, R2, and R3, like this, first of all, ask yourself, which ones are in parallel? Which ones are in parallel? Which ones are in series? And secondly, what is the equivalence resistance of this system like this? Okay. So once you identified uh, what is in parallel, what is in series, um, then uh, you can find out the resistance. Maybe I should address one thing over here. Um, yeah, maybe I'm, let me answer the first one for you. Uh, um, can you see between R2 and R3, what is, is that in series or in parallel? If anyone can put that in the chat. Good, and so that's easy. How about R1 and R2? Yeah, so that's actually not in series. So this is a little bit subtle um, because if it's in series, then they have to be connected with one line that's not sort of splitting out, right? So there's a split out over here. So R1 and R2 is actually not in series nor not in parallel. So they don't actually have to be one or the other, okay? So uh, what, when you solve problems like this is, um, oh, I probably should give you numbers, uh, but let's say all of them is the same resistance. Let's say they all are. So you can find this in terms of R. Uh, Right, so R1 and R2 is not necessary in, uh, in, in series because um, in series means that they should be in a straight line like this without something splitting out uh, like this. So if something splits out, then these two are no longer in series. Okay. Um, so uh, what you do is you first find the res equivalent resistance of this, which you can denote uh, R12 in terms of R. I won't tell you what the answer is. Okay. So this is a notation we will write, sorry, two, three. Uh, so that, that's an equivalent resistance of R2 and R3. Now you see that R1 and R2, 3 together is in series, and then you can get the final answer this way. Okay, all right. So um, next, tomorrow we'll uh, start to look at much more of these type of examples. I'll actually give you more concrete examples um, of that. I'll show you uh, some, we'll do actually some examples like this and then get to more uh, complicated ones like this and I'll show you some techniques. It's going to be more problem solving based in the lecture tomorrow. Okay, so you have all the basic concepts here. Okay, any questions? All right, good. All right, so I haven't overrun too much today. I'm getting slightly better, so I won't keep you any longer than this. Thank you very much for staying and good luck tomorrow with your topics test. I'll stay, I'll try to answer as much questions on Piazza as possible tonight and see you tomorrow. <laughs>